Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of His Excellency Dr. Sultan Mohammed Naimi, Director General of the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research, we would like to welcome our guest today, Mr. Carlos Mustavo, Director, Academic Director at Institute de Ciencia Politica in Colombia. My name is Awad Al-Bareki, and I will be discussing today with Mr. Mustavo the political and economic issue in Latin America for the next 30 minutes, and then we welcome our guests to discuss in Q&A session for the 15 minutes. And allow me now to introduce our guest. Mr. Mursavo is the Academic Director at the Institute de Ciencia Politica, ICB, as well as the Director of Legislative Project, and Security and Security and Strategy Coordinator for the ICB Policy Lab. He has a, a master's degree in national security and defense studies, as well as a law degree. It's my pleasure to have you today, Mr. Mursavo. To provide some context in today's discussion, I would like to invite you to give us uh, some kind of overview on the most pressing political and economic issue in Latin America. So the floor is yours. Yeah, you can. Good morning to everyone. I am really honored to be here today to talk about Latin America and the perspectives of economic opportunities and political challenges. I want to be, uh, give you an overview for the situation of the region. According to the International Monetary Fund, outlook for Latin America and the Caribbean growth in 2022 is forecast to be the lowest of the region, lower than anywhere else in the world. It can be said that the economic recovery will not be rapid and sustained over time, and that the di direct and indirect effects of the pandemic will have long-term consequences. Due to the deficiencies in the economic policies adopted by the governments of the region, even before the pandemic, in addition, the region will have to face a complex and uncertain global context arising from the disruptions caused by the pandemic, such as the container and chips crisis, energy crisis, food prices, inflation, and public debt. According to the World Bank estimates, the region is expected to record an average growth of 2.8% in 2022, similar to that experience between 2017 and 2019, a return to sluggish growth is expected despite clearly favorable external factors for a region that relies heavily on international trade, external financing, and commodity prices. The disappointing growth, growth is a major obstacle to the economic due to the domestic factors. In addition to these estimates, it is necessary to take into account that 99.5% of the productive sector in Latin America and the Caribbean is made up of a small, micro, small, and medium enterprises, which generate approximately 60% of the employment in the region, which according to the World Bank data has fallen drastically and has not yet recovered. Let me give you a global view of the effects of the pandemic and prospects of, for recovery. According to the World Trade Organization, the world trade in goods had a 9.2% drop in 2020 and 7.2% 7 recovery is expected in 2021. Likewise, exports from Latin America and the Caribbean fell at an annual rate of approximately 3.2% in 2020 after falling 2.2% in 2019. A rise in commodity prices in early 21 fueled a recovery in unreal GDP growth of 63.0% this year by 2022 GDP world growth by 3%. The region will remain below its pre-pandemic level at the end of 2021. Despite this growth projections, there is evidence of weaknesses in the labor markets that translate into unemployment and informality, particularly due to the effects of government measures to deal with the pandemic, such as quarantines and massive generalized closure of businesses and commerce. Acknowledging that the pandemic is a persistent problem, Expectations for the coming months are optimistic, considering 
the improvement in global demand and rising commodity prices. This contrasts with the World Trade Organization data indicating that the world trade will be growth 8% by 2021, driven by China and expansionary policies in the United States and the European Union. It is important to consider that these sectors face restrictions, the sectors of the new uh, energy, petroleum, and gas. According to the Getulio Vargas Foundation, regarding what some have called a new commodities boom, the expectation of one more year of high prices prevails 58%, and in second place, with a percentage of 23% by the end of 2021. It would not then be a super cycle of high commodity prices as it happened before. It is important to consider that these sectors face the restrictions that have been attempted to impose with the framework of policies promoted by the international community for climate change and energy transition issues, which include radical measures for countries to prohibit the exportation and exploration of hydrocarbons and coal, and even pressure for banks to reduce definitively limit financing for projects in these sectors, as pointed out by the Financial Times in a November 3 article on the occasion of the COP26 summit in Glasgow. In addition, several countries in the region are facing a strong social, political, and judicial activism against other extractive industries such as mining. On the other hand, it is highlighted in the report that around 25% of the specialists consider that the problem of shortages in inputs and or raw material is serious and 57% as moderate or slight. It should be noted that the larger, more div diversified and internationalized the production Paris, the greater the probability of shortages. The economic recovery is marked uncertainty in the face of tiny global financial conditions, sovereignty debt, rollover risk, and social unrest as a year with an intense electoral calendar looms in countries such as Chile, Colombia, Brazil, and Argentina, with two possi possible radical shifts to leftist governments in Chile and Colombia that would put economic progress and political stability at risk. According to the last year's Latin America economic surveys of Getulio Vargas Foundation, there is a lack of confidence in economic policy due to the lack of innovation and adequate infrastructure, corruption, unfavorable climate for foreign investors, legal and administrative barriers for investors, lack of international competitiveness, and political instability. Added to this are the public debt problems of several regions countries, which in recent decades have gone into debt to finance public spending, while at the same time increasing the size of the state without this necessarily resulting in improved levels of development. In addition, public spending is inefficient in areas such as the public procurement, monetary transfer, subsidies, and salaries of public employees, according to a study of the Inter-American Development Bank. Before the pandemic, according to the World Bank study, at least two-thirds of people in the region who overcome poverty and therefore had the opportunity to experience social mobility did so because of economic growth and not because of subsidy and cash trans transfer schemes from the state. It should, be called, it should be recalled that in the 20s, the emerging markets, such as Latin America ones, experienced rapid growth in the face of a surge in world trade, and as a result of major reforms gathered towards free trade and insertion into global value chains, which conceived with the commodity boom that came to an end in the 20, 2010s. It, although it should be noted that the increase in supply chain trade was 0.1% between 1995 and 20 15 compared to 19% in the rest of the world. The Latin American countries that in recent decades managed to experience higher levels of productivity, economic growth, progress, prosperity, and democratic stability had something in common. Institutions that began to favor and guarantee economic freedoms, free trade, private property, the rule of law, and legal security. Of course, these achievements have been modest in comparison with other emerging economies. 
Currently, according to the 2021 International Trade Barrier Index, prepared by the Tholet Foundation, Latin America and the Caribbean are at the regional average with respect to direct and indirect trade barriers. This trend towards trade barrier will be corrected if the region is take advantage of the opportunities arising from the current situation, given the option to the US companies to relocate their factories from China to Latin America, seeking to overcome dependence and redefine the dynamics of maritime transportation, taking into account factors such as the geographical proximity. One aspect that is evident in this index is related to the barriers to digital commerce, which it must be said are currently a trend in different countries around the world, but in the region have become more restrictive. On the one hand, because many issues such as labor issues are still regulated with rules from more than 10 decades ago, and it has been the courts that have defined the disputes that have arisen in sectors such as digital messaging and mobility apps. On the other hand, because these sectors of collaborative gig and digital economy have been equated with traditional ones, imposing licenses and additional requirements to operate that do not take into account the realities of the new economic relationships that develop in these new economies. Of course, despite this uncertainty and adverse environment created by governments, the private sector continues to generate opportunities that could lead the region to take advantage of the fourth industrial revolution. According to a data on Y Combinator, there is a startup boom in the region. In other words, opportunities are emerging from innovators and entrepreneurs and favorable environment for a new investment and therefore economic growth driven by a new technologies can be created as long as governments understand the dynamics and disruption that are emerging from the digital economy and if they do not try to impose barrier regulations, taxes, and prohibition, especially to protect specific sector or interest groups. Latin America faces regulatory, bureaucratic, and tax problems that prevent the consolidation of business fabric to overcome informality and create productive linkages, companies to integrate into supply chains. One of these issues is evidenced by the results of the bureaucracy index prepared by Atlas Network and in which the Institute of Political Science participate. The main result of this index is that the region faces enormous bureaucratic barriers that require companies to allocate enormous human resources and time to comply with the requirements imposed by the states on various issues, regagging from labor, tax, and operational matters. The results of these indicators allow us for a uh, a hypothesis of analysis and assessment for opportunities. The guarantee of sustained economic growth will depend on the ado of adoption of liberal trade and economic policies that guarantee legal security and private property rights, facilitate innovation, and attract the necessary investment to develop the physical and logistical infrastructure needed to enter the global trade. So let's talk about uh, these few minutes about the political constraints that pose a, a scenario of uncertainty. Mexico with Manuel eh, Andrés López Obrador and Peru with Pedro Castillo, openly populist and authoritarian leaders. These countries are already experiencing institutional deterioration and weakening of democracy, which will impact the economic development model for the months to come. Nationalizations and intervention in the economy generate uncertainty and put the stability of these countries at risk. In the Mexican case, the US and Texas most lucrative trade relationship may be at risk as President Lopez Obrador attempts rapid expansion of government to control over Mexico's primary resource and energy exports. In Argentina, after the previous Congress election, the socialist government of Alberto Fernandez and Cristina Kirchner is facing new challenges and, and change due to the loss of the majority in the Senate. The new majority will try to force the government to change its interventionist and inflationary policies, which has reached 52% according to the OICD data, and has led, led the country to suffer hyperinflation, shortages, unemployment, devaluation, and increased poverty. For its part, the government will seek an agreement with the opposition to present the first week of December 
an economic plan that will allow it to renegotiate with the IMF the 44 billion in debt, most of it which comes due to payment next year and in 2023. Last Sunday, the first presidential round was held in Chile, where the leader of the right, Jose Antonio Cas, came first with 28%, and the leader of the radical left, Gabriel Boris, Boric, came second with 25%. Both candidates are going to be in the second presidential round in December. Gabriel Boric emerged in the framework of a violent protest that took place in Chile between 2018 and 2020. His campaign proposals are characterized by going against the current Chilean economic model of free market that allowed the country to become one of the most prosperous in the region. He also identified himself, ideologically speaking, with the rest of the leftist leaders from the Sao Paulo Forum. He will have to wait to see, we will have to wait to see who wins in the second round and see how the Constitutional Convention concludes in 2022. In Colombia, my country, Gustavo Petro, a former guerrilla, allied to Nicolás Maduro's regime, a member of the Sao Paulo Forum, is leading the polls for the presidential election in 2022. The country is facing the possibility of this illiberal, protectionist, interventionist, and authoritarian populist coming to power in the coming months, whose main agenda is to abolish the free market system, close the country to international trade, and impose confiscatory tax regimes. Of course, Colombia faces other problems in addition to the threat posed by Gustavo Petro. The country has a labor informality of 47%, unemployment of 12%, and poverty of 42%. The labor market is rigid with legal security problems and weaknesses in protection of private property, especially land in rural areas. As appointed out by Legatum Institute, the country faces competitiveness and productivity problems because non-extractive sectors have lacked behind due to excessive regulatory burden, infrastructure gaps, and low competition and integration in international markets. Overcoming these barriers will make possible to attract investment to sector in which the country has enormous potential due to its advantage in terms of natural resources, such as food production, and exporting them to countries where demand is increasingly. In the case of Brazil, the country is facing the effects of the global crisis and domestic problems. By October, inflation was equivalent to 10.67% according to the OECD data. Increases in the price of food, fuel and electricity, devaluation and problems in the supply chain. In a pre-electoral context, in which Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, leftist and member of the Sao Paulo Forum, could compete in 2024 for the president against current president Jair Bolsonaro, the government has opted for welfare policies and a scheme of monetary transfer finance through public spending, which could lead to higher inflation and interest rates as pointed out by the Financial Times. The opportunity to accelerate the reactivation and recovery of the, community, of the economy to return to the path of growth and social mobility recorded in recent decades before the pandemic and improved the productivity will depend on the ability of the Latin American governments to overcome fundamental problems that have to do with the failure of the state to guarantee and facilitate the exercise of economic freedoms, entrepreneurship, innovation, and the entrepreneurial function. It's necessary, it will be necessary to redouble efforts to implement productive linkages, especially establish supply chains, and add value by attracting companies seeking to relocate. In addition, opportunities can materialize if, if infrastructure and logistical problems are solved, where significant foreign investment could be attracted, for which it will, it will be necessary to ensure stability and legal security. Mr. Monsalvo, yeah, I think we, we will cover a lot of your talk in our okay. question. I will finish in one yep. minute. All right, <laughs> I'm waiting. The region needs to attract investment to strengthen the private sector, especially entrepreneurs, companies, and think tanks, which we will be able to promote the reforms necessary to unleash economic growth, productivity, and the strengthening of institutions, especially the rule of law, the legal security, the protection of, proper, of private property rights, and the investment stability. An inclusive prosperity agenda for the region depends of, on opening up 
to the world, seeking new partners and markets, and guiding efforts to integrate into global value chains. Of course, United Arab Emirates are a strategic partner with enormous potential and an example for many Latin American and Caribbean countries in terms of the possibilities to take advantage of natural resources while promoting creativity, innovation, overcoming poverty, and sustainable development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Masalvo, for this informative insight. Uh, you touch upon uh, the climate change. And as we all know, climate change is one of the most significant issues facing not only Latin American countries, but also the whole world. So uh, from your perspective, Mr. Mansalvo, how do you assess uh, the collaboration between government, civil society, private sector, in addressing this kind of, of, of issue in Latin America in general? Approaches to climate change problems are very different uh, between countries. Most governments, uh, they have established policies in favor the reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And the private sector, for its part, is making large investment to reconvert its production models in such a way that they are friendly with the environment. Civil society have different attitudes. They are those who are radically opposed to business activity and to seek to ban sectors such as mining, oil, and gas. But the Latin American countries need to understand that the commitments from the international community needs to have an approach according to the reality. We are not a developed countries. We need to uh, take advantage of our natural resources, including new innovations, of course, to taking uh, action against the climate change, but according with our capacity. We need to develop better practices and strengthen the private sector to uh, take advantage of the, of the production and try to resolve structural problems as poverty and uh, the necessity to integrate to the uh, global yep. change. Um, uh, and we also here in the UAE, we, we take uh, climate change very seriously. As you know, we are hosting COP28 in 2023. Do you think there's like some area of potential cooperation between UAE and Latin America in this field? Absolutely especially in the exchange and, and cooperation for development uh, of technology innovations, as well as the generation of scientific knowledge and research that allowed to design of public policies based on evidence and data, which allow promoting an articulation between the public and the private sectors to guarantee economic growth under environmental sustainability criteria. We are still in the bilateral relation between Colombia and the uh, UAE. You know, a few weeks ago, uh, President of the Republic of Colombia, Ivan Duque Marquez, was here in the UAE, and he stated in an interview, and I will quote him here, he said, I really believe that the next challenge to is to trouble trade relationship between Colombia and UAE in the next 24 months and be able to have the highest investment endeavor from UAE in Colombia. What economic opportunity do you see from your perspective, Mr. Monsalvo, that the UAE and Colombia can have and thrive in this, uh, in this aspect, and vice versa, from Colombia, UAE, and UAE to Colombia? I think for Colombia, it's important to stop looking at the United States and the European Union as the main commercial and diplomatic partners. The United Arab Emirates is a, an ally with enormous potential beyond investment in strategic sectors. Colombia has much to learn from this country and to take advantage of this relationship to become an important play, player in the Arab world. This will depend on the ability to promote actions and projects in various areas, but especially in commercial exchange and in knowledge. The main restriction may be, of course, uh, for this kind of agenda, a uh, radical change in the political environment in Colombia. But I think we have a lot of uh, opportunities, and we need to start identifying the shared values that we have and the role that we can play in the uh, international community. We can be strongest if we understand 
that as a countries, uh, South countries, or uh, improve the South-South cooperation, we can play a major role in the international community. That's very great. Um, allow me now to take you a little bit to the, to the Middle East. Uh, there are, you know, a lot of frequent reports about Hezbollah's activities in Latin America, uh, such as hum human trafficking, arms, uh, uh, money laundering, counterfeiting. And we also know that there is a, a relationship between terrorism and organized crime in Latin America. How do you see that Hezbollah's activities affecting the security and foreign policy of Latin America? They, are, they have present in Latin America since the 1980s, even before, but uh, Latin America countries have been unsuccessful in fighting criminal organizations such as Hezbollah because they don't know their nature, nor have they bothered to study their modus operandi. They don't understand that Hezbollah is a super facilitator that contribute to create a criminal networks in Latin America. Some efforts have recently started to, to be made in the region. We at, at the ICP at the beginning of this year held a large international event with experts from the United States, Israel, and the United Arab Emirates to explain to the region the risk and threats that Hezbollah and Iran represent for the region. A policy needs to be defined to face the convergence of criminal networks and extra-regional actors. The region needs to cooperate with other countries that's facing the same threat to develop civil and military cap capabilities to confront these criminal groups and their illicit economies. Uh, but also uh, there are a perception that uh, some Latin American countries, not all of them, they have some kind of lax uh, approach to Hezbollah's activities. Uh, do you see that, that some government are working hard to address this issue? Or they are, to some extent, they are happy to, to stay lax? To, some, to some governments are friendly with Hezbollah because they have established relationship with Iran, like Venezuela, like Nicaragua, like Bolivia, like Cuba, because they understand that Hezbollah play a special and important role in their interest to disestablish the region. So Hezbollah is an important actor, a criminal actor. And uh, of course, other countries like Colombia, Brazil, and, uh, and even Argentina in, in different moments try to fight against Hezbollah, and Peru, for example. Right now, in the region, uh, the governments are more uh, active against Hezbollah because they, at, the, at the end of the Trump administration, the US government promote uh, 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 different efforts to the region that try to, uh, all the governments declare, or, or the majority of the governments declare Hezbollah as a terrorist and criminal, a, tra a, tra a threat of a, represent, Hezbollah represents a criminal, a transnational criminal organization. Uh, uh, and they are like working some legal aspect of uh, combating uh, Hezbollah in terms of like laws, or they are just... Uh... No, they declare it, that they, they fight it, and they try to uh, understand how they operate. Recently in Colombia, uh, the authorities discovered a plan from uh, uh, Hezbollah actives that try to, or want to kill, plan to kill some Israeli uh, entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my last question will be, Mr. Mursavo, uh, regarding the U.S. Uh, China competition. And uh, as you know, that uh, US is uh, a new region. And uh, my question will be now, um, how Latin American states perceiving or, or at least um, uh, taking the competition between US and China, are they like taking aside or they try to balance the relationship between the two countries? For many decades, Latin America was not the priority of the U.S. foreign policy. And China take advantage of that situation. China have established investment in strategic sec sectors in different countries in Latin America. Uh, 
um, infrastructure, transportation, uh, finance, uh, banking, telecommunications. And now, Estados Unidos want to, to fight the presence of China in Latin America and try to they stop it and, and control the situation. Latin American countries can't depend all the time of the foreign policy, of the US foreign policy, but needs to take a, with a cautionary actions, the actions also from China. We are in the middle of, of, the, of two uh, countries that have interest in the region, but not real interest, a strategic interest. Uh, more than a, a partnership is a relationship based on the interest of uh, natural resources. So many countries they, in Latin America also want to, to uh, take advantage of the, the actual situation the, with the companies that they, in the U.S. that are in China that want to relocate in Latin America, and it's a big opportunity for the region. I think Latin America needs to learn how to play in this new scenario of complexity and look at the rest of the world. Yep, I think uh, Latin America is uh, similar to other regions in the world who are caught up in the, between the competition between U.S. and China. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mersavo, for this great uh, insight. I really enjoyed it, and I think also the audience. And now allow me to open the floor for a Q&A question. Please, uh, who want to ask a question, just raise your hand, and we'll take it from there. Mr. Mansav, thank you for your very comprehensive overview of Latin America, and thank you for attending uh, at the center. My name is Omar Al-Marzugi. I'm in the research department. I wanted to go back to your point about the balance between economic considerations and environmental responsibilities within Latin America. While there are challenges and economic challenges that are created by meeting those responsibilities, there are also new opportunities within new sectors such as renewable energy. So how well positioned are Latin American countries in order to become leaders within these new industries? Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Latin America needs to go forward with the energy transition. But right now, the region faces different problems. Some of there are structural and others is a, a, the result of the, of the global situation. But Latin America needs to attract invest for the conventional sectors to improve the production of energy and that invest in innovation for the energy transition. It's a, a, a big opportunity and I think in this moment uh, after the, the COP26 in Glasgow Latin America needs to recognize that there are not a, they are not or we are not a, a, a important player in that kind of summit. If we want to com, com, to advance in becoming a, a real important actor, we need to attract investment and lead the energy transition uh, in the region and in face of the necessities of the world. You know, this, in this moment, the world faces a, a energy crisis and. We in Latin America have enough uh, natural resources to provide energy. It's uh, amazing that in some countries, the politicians try to uh, change the model of uh, extraction of hydrocarbons uh, to one day to another, forgetting the reality of the energy sector. Hello, Hello Mr. Monsalve. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, my name is Javier Rojas. I am from Rabdan Academy. And um, my question is, well, you know, Latin America, one of the common features um, is that we all have presidential systems. I, I am from Mexico, like the U.S. So in the last two elections in the U.S., we, we have noticed that there is increasing polarization. And this is also something, you know, that is uh, happening in Chile. We also, you know, saw that in, in, in Brazil, you know, all this move from Excuse Lula. Me. Can Bolsonaro. you take your mask, please? Sorry, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Can, you. can you listen to me better? So I was just wondering how do you, how resilient do you think democracy will be 
in the coming years. In, I mean, if this increasing polarization uh, continues to be characteristic, because you know, in the in the case of the U.S., I mean, it's one of the oldest democracies, and they were, um, it was resilient. But I don't know if this is going to be the case in in most Latin American countries. And then, what will be then the political and economic challenges of that? Absolutely, the, the the first part of the of the presentation uh, that I made for this uh, uh, event. I talk about the populism. Populism is maybe the principal threat to democracy in Latin American countries. We faced uh, uh, problems, especially because our institutional demo or the democratic institutions are very weak. And in the recent years, the advance of uh, populism is the result of the actions, deliberate actions and systematically actions of organizations like the Foro de Sao Paulo or the Grupo de Puebla, that they want to promote populist leaders to take the control of the, of the countries, and they are socialist. And as you know, the socialist, uh, from uh, at least in the Latin America perspective, they are anti-free market, they are anti-business. They only want to rent seeking from the states and create new elites that basically uh, leave from rent seeking. This, the, that's the, the reality. Uh, the, the example ob obviously is Venezuela, but also uh, Nicaragua, also Cuba, and now Mexico. Mexico's facing enormous uh, problems with uh, Manuel Andres Lopez Obrador. Now Peru, in Peru, they want to stop mining radi the, the, in, a radical, in a radical way. And uh, Argentina is other example. In all these countries, the economic perspectives uh, face the threat posed by the populist governments. That's, that's, the, that's the reality. We need to advance in, in, in establish a better institutions, you know, understand it as a, as a rules, as a, a rules of place, cultural values that improve the institutionality to face the risk of populism. I can share you with you uh, the, the, the complete document, and, and if anyone else wanted, I have the document. Yes, I totally agree with you, Mr. Monsalvo. The populist uh, narrative is not only in Latin America, it's all the world. You know, you see in Europe, some kind of government embarrassed some kind of, uh, you know, populist uh, ideology. Mr. Monsalvo, I want to go back to Hezbollah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's an interesting uh, subject to delve in, in more. Um, Hezbollah's activities, as you, we mentioned before, is like is, uh, to some kind, some kind, some extent, is growing in Latin America. And this perception, most of Middle East countries say Latin America they have lax approach in dealing with you know uh, with Hezbollah. Uh, I'm wondering that uh, if there's any kind of laws preventing uh, Hezbollah's activities in some kind of Latin American countries uh, in terms of, you know, um, money laundering, let's say, human trafficking, uh, arms, you know? No, actually no. Actually, that's, that's one of the, of the lack of uh, uh, political attention that our, our politicians have made about Hezbollah. We don't have special, special laws. Recently, some governments, like the Colombia government in 2020, declared Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. Before that, we considered part of a, a political activities in Lebanon, a political party in Lebanon, you know? So it's, it's, it's necessary to promote these kind of approaches. But I think it, this situation is the result of a bad comprehension of the new realities of the world. Latin American countries, as many other countries, continue perceiving the threats of the, of secu for security only in terms of conventional threats. Hezbollah poses an asymmetric threat. You need to develop all a doctrine and a public policy approach for asymmetric threat. Now we're facing a fourth generation warfare around the world. And that's, for example, why the United States continue losing wars, because they believe that it's uh, through the forces, the, the military forces, that you win the, the wars. These new kind of wars, like we 
fight against organizations like Hezbollah or like FARC in Colombia or the ALN in Colombia, or against Venezuela regime, is a world that need to develop a new approach, a new paradigm, a paradigm that understand that is the legitimacy that you need to win to win the war. Is with with approach with an integral approach, not only the military, the civil approach and develop these kind of capabilities to face these new threats. And do you think that the Hezbollah's activities in Latin America have some, you know, make it difficult for some Latin America to deal with the, with the Arab countries? I think that they, they are a global criminal network, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they will take advantage of the criminal activities in Latin America to finance Hezbollah, in, in Lebanon, and, but also in the region, in, here in the Arab countries. Uh, Latin America is a, I don't want to say, but it's like a, a kind of a, a paradise for economic illicit uh, activities, you know? Not only co cocaine or, or illegal mining, no? But uh, the money laundering in Latin America is, uh, is prosperous is because we have weak institutions to fight against the, this kind of activity, so Hezbollah, understand that reality and go to Latin America to extract the money and use the money to uh, fight their war against the different countries and organizations and people and, and promote their, their interests and, and the interests of Iran, of course. In conclusion, um, on behalf of His Excellency, Dr. Sultan Mohammed Al Naimi, we would like to thank you again, Mr. Monsavo, and the audience for, the, for their participation. And, uh, Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much. Thank you.